thank you all for coming. And uh, after that introduction, I guess I should say, start out by saying, um, this is gonna be very informal. Uh, if you feel like asking questions, you know, I'm, it's no problem that we'll just stop and, and deal with those questions as they come up. Um, I'm probably the, the church bureaucrat you've always wanted to corner because I've worked for the church for so long and in so many different areas. I, I, I really do know a lot of what's going on. So feel free to ask questions and, uh, and let's start talking about a very difficult topic, uh, especially for uh, a community that uh, is, is essentially pro-life. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, issue, uh, but as we get through this, hopefully you'll understand why we are where we are today. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for being here and uh, I guess the thing to do is to go to the next slide. Um, as many of you know, the Holy Father has, uh, has called for uh, Catholics uh, to uh, oppose the use of the death penalty. Or as he has put it, uh, the death penalty has no place in modern society today. Now, the reason he says that, rather than uh, the death penalty is immoral, is because of our history, because of the teaching. And the teaching goes back a long, long time. It's, it's grounded in the Bible, in our biblical teaching, and which even goes back even further to our Jewish heritage, to the Talmudic teaching. Um, and in Deuteronomy, uh, Christ, or God says to us to be pro-life, to choose life. So um, it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you that in the very first couple hundred years of the church, the Catholic Church was very opposed to the use of the death penalty. I mean, totally, unequivocally, don't use it. And the reason is because our Lord and Savior was executed. It was a horrifying uh, experience for people. It was a saving grace for all of us, but the natural reaction was we would not ever think of executing anybody. But that changed over time. And the reason that that changed is because as we started leaving the catacombs and the secret areas where we worshiped as, as hidden Catholics, societies began embracing Christianity. Kingdoms, princes began converting to Catholicism. So the state that we used to fear became the state that embraced Christianity. So the teaching evolved so that we, we became part of uh, the mainstream. We became part of societies that had to protect themselves from people who were dangerous. So uh, as around the third, fourth century, you started seeing um, uh, Christian kings saying, well, we need, there are times we need to use the death penalty. And that was kind of loosey-goosey for several hundred years. So in the 13th century, there was uh, one of the doctors of the church, one of the most famous names in Catholic teaching, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who is considered one of the finest legal minds that ever lived. He came up with uh, basically a, a set of rules that if a society is going to use the death penalty, it has to follow three rules. First, if you're gonna, kill, if you're gonna execute somebody, it, you have to know that's the correct person. There can never be any doubt whatsoever. Second, the punishment has to fit the crime. You cannot execute somebody for stealing bread. It has to be for something such as murdering another person. And three, the society can have no other option in order to protect itself. So that's three prongs. And that's been the teaching for a long, long time. Um, and, and so we can never be in a position where, where we just outright say, the, the death penalty is immoral. It's just immoral to kill another person. We can't say that. Um, uh, what was her name? Uh, St. Joan of Arc. We did her. We executed her. Um, and we've over the centuries, supported every civil society's use of the death penalty up until the 20th century. And in the 20th century, things changed, especially from the perspective of the, of the leaders of our church. 
They changed in Europe because you saw Nazism. You saw uh, fascism. You saw the rise of governments, legitimate governments, use the idea of protecting society to kill gypsies, to kill gays, to kill people who disagreed with whatever they were espousing. And that turned the teaching on its head. So approximately right around uh, the 60s, 70s, the church actually started advocating against using the death penalty anymore. And um, that brings us to 1980. In 1980, the US Catholic Conference of Bishops took a position to oppose the use of the death penalty anymore in the United States. And when they did that, there were approximately 38 states that were using the death penalty and two jurisdictions, the federal government and, military, uh, uh, and the military. Uh, so you had 41 jurisdictions that were actively using the death penalty. And for a long time, even though the bishops were advocating against using it, nothing changed. In 2000, there were still 38 jurisdictions and the military and the federal government still using the death penalty. And the bishops were trying to figure out how do we get the, the teaching across that we shouldn't be using this anymore because in a lot of those jurisdictions, they were violating all three of the prongs that our church was teaching us uh, to go by. They were killing people who might have been innocent. They were uh, killing people who hadn't even killed. In fact, there are still states today that have laws on their books that, will, uh, that people will qualify for for an execution, uh, even if they've never murdered. Here in California, and whenever I bring this up, people get really nervous, but here in California, we have uh, something called Megan's Law. And Megan's Law, which most of it is actually pretty good to try to protect young people, but it does have uh, one stipulation, that if uh, a sex abuser abuses a second time, they're eligible for the death penalty. As horrible as that is, we think that's wrong. A sex abuse is a horrible, horrible thing. Nobody understands that better than the Catholic Church. But murdering some or killing somebody, and they haven't even murdered, is wrong. And three, there are other ways to protect society. With the prison system that we have, with the criminal justice system that we have, we don't need to execute them. And the reason we don't is because we believe in a life after death. We believe there is salvation. And we believe that every person should have every opportunity of finding their salvation before they die. Because once they die, we don't, it may be more difficult to get into heaven um, if they've found no salvation. So um, the bishops uh, put together some money and said, okay, we're going to ask Catholics, we're just gonna ask Catholics what they think of the death penalty, why they support it or why they don't support it. So I was working at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops at this point, and, um, and so we were instructed to uh, take all this money and do a national survey of Catholics from all over the US. Um, and we started talking to um, some research companies like Zogby, like, uh, uh, the Greenberg uh, folks and, and all the different, and we asked for bids. Who's willing to do this for the money we have? And right as we were taking bids, September 11th happened. So we thought as a staff and with under advisement of the bishops, right now is not the time to do a survey on the death penalty. Let's back off a little bit and we'll wait. We said, okay, so we waited, we waited. Waited a year or two. And so then we thought, okay, let's go forward now. And just as we started taking bids again, we invaded Iraq. And so we thought, well, you know what? Everybody's in a real fervor to win the war and get those people who were, who were guilty of attacking us. So let's wait right now. So we said, okay, we waited another year or two. And then we said, okay. And we started taking bids again. And right as we were taking bids, 
the Washington Sniper happen. I don't know if any of you are aware. Does, do people remember the Washington Sniper? Uh, it was really scary stuff. Uh, people would take their kids to school and they'd get shot. They'd be at a gas station. They'd get shot. So people were really angry. But it was at this point we sat down as a staff and with our, our committee of bishops and we all looked at each other and said, you know what? There's never going to be a time where we aren't afraid. And isn't that what we're talking about when it comes to using the death penalty, to protecting our society? We do it because we're kind of afraid. So we went ahead and we did the survey. Um, we surveyed Catholics from the Northeast, the Southeast, Pacific Northwest, Central, Midwestern, and the Southwest. Uh, we did Catholics who were um, Irish. We did Mexicans. We did Germans. We did everybody we could find. And we went into the survey thinking uh, we'd get the same percentage of Catholics just as regular society. And as we know, uh, most of the surveys uh, in society tell us that approximately 64% of Americans support the use of the death penalty. Um, we thought that's what we would see when we got it. But what we got instead was that 49% of Catholics support the use of the death penalty. 47% do not support the death penalty. We thought we hired the wrong people. They really botched this up. So we figured, okay, look, we think this is wrong. Go back and redo it. We don't want to go through the whole process of hiring a different company. Go back and redo it and make sure you follow these criteria, which they did. They came back and it was 49% supported the death penalty. 48% of Catholics don't support the death penalty. So then we started thinking, well, maybe they're right. Maybe the teaching is actually starting to take. And then it dawned on us that actually the bishops had been teaching for a long time that using the death penalty was wrong and that maybe some people were listening and specifically those people were young. Um, which was interesting to us because uh, we weren't sure where, <laughs> where the youth were going to come out on this. But those who were uh, 18 to 30 uh, were the ones that were uh, the most opposed to the use of the death penalty. Now, up until this point, uh, we really hadn't had no, any victories, even though the bishops were very involved in lots of different uh, uh, fights across the country. So they were looking for a message that we could use to carry to, uh, to folks so that we could sell the message. Um, because it's, it's a tough sell. People are afraid. Um, but then something happened that we didn't anticipate happening, uh, and it was a Supreme Court case. And where is that one? Atkins. Atkins and, uh, and Simmons were two Supreme Court cases right around the same time, 2002 and then about 2004. Now, Simmons uh, is a Supreme Court case that the bishops actually wrote an amicus brief for which is called a friend of the court brief. And in both Atkins and Simmons, the Supreme Court justices cited what the bishops wrote. And in Simmons, the issue was, was it constitutional to execute somebody who had been a minor when they had committed a crime, when they had committed a murder? And our argument was, as a society, in almost everything we do, we say people who are under 18 years of age are not adults can't sign a contract, can't go to war. So can we hold them to the, a higher standard of committing a murder? So they cited our, our brief and it was part of the, re, the, the majority that decided, no, it's unconstitutional to execute minors. Atkins was the case that took up the question, was it constitutional to execute somebody who was legally mentally retarded? And there again, the bishops wrote an amicus brief, which influenced and was cited by the court. It's, and the decision was, no, that part of the rationale for holding anybody accountable for their actions in the United States since the beginning is the right mens rea. They had to have the right intent. They intended to do something bad. 
So if a person doesn't have that capacity, we can't hold them to that same standard. So if they're mentally retarded, and I know I'm saying that wrong, it should be mentally something else, challenged, challenged. Um, then they can't be held to the same standard. Now those two decisions opened up a lot of discussions across uh, the country. And all of a sudden, um, our message was very clear. If there are times when it's unconstitutional, when is it right to use? And that is when we started seeing states actually get rid of the death penalty. We saw Kansas, we saw Connecticut, we saw New Jersey all start to abolish the death penalty at their state level. Today, there are 31 states that still use the death penalty, plus the military and um, uh, the federal government. They still have it on the books. But we're very hopeful now that it'll be abolished, especially since one of those states, the last state was Nebraska, just this past year. Nebraska is a very conservative state, very pro-life state, and they got rid of the death penalty. That gives us a lot of hope. There was a trend of thinking that it would be those liberal progressive states like New Jersey and Connecticut and Illinois that would be the ones that would lead the way and they did, but we would never have thought of Nebraska. Now, we are close in several other states to getting rid of the death penalty. One of those states is California. Now, California, even though it's got a reputation for being very progressive on some things, has got a reputation for being very conservative on some things, like crime, and being tough on crime. So, this year, there is an effort to put a ballot initiative on this year's November election ballot to, that would uh, outlaw or abolish the death penalty here in California. We have a train. Um, yeah, good. Um, I've been in contact with a group called the Death Penalty Focus Group. They're out of San Francisco and they're leading the charge. The bishops of California have a policy that they do not endorse or oppose any ballot initiative until it actually makes the ballot. We gave, the bishops have one exception to that so far, and that was for the assisted suicide effort, uh, which failed miserably. Not because of us, but we learned a lot from that exercise. So when the death penalty folks came to us, we said, you know what, you're gonna have to get it on the ballot before we, uh, before we take a position. Uh, but we're going to pray that it, you guys are successful. When I spoke to them this past Monday, they said, we think we're, we're there. We're, we're going to get it certified uh, by the state secretary, uh, and we think it's going to make it onto the ballot. So this November, Californians will get the opportunity again to end the death penalty. In 2012, the initiative was on there, and it failed by 2% of the vote. Not because of Southern California, though. Southern California was overwhelmingly in favor of getting rid of the death penalty. So we think we're really, really close, and we think this year is the year to actually do it. I'm not sure if St. Louis has been helping gather signatures, but once this thing gets on the ballot, we're hoping that all of the parishes of the archdiocese can help uh, get rid of, uh, can help pass this, this ballot initiative, which we think is great. Yeah, go ahead. I find, I find for that to be put on the ballot in front of them. And the neat thing about that, we're going to make them work to pay this because everybody opposes life uh, uh, life uh, because of the money factor. They're going to make them pay or get jobs or whatever they do in prison to work to uh, mend or stay and uh, also help the families that they feel. That's right. That's going to be part of, uh, part of their sentence once it's been commuted to life without parole. And I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that we discovered after the court cases started going our way was that um, the number of people who are uh, found guilty of capital crimes and sentenced to die has been shrinking. The number of people who are, who are convicted and sent to death row is shrinking primarily because of one thing that the bishops had been pushing really hard and went 
to most of the states back in the 1990s. And that is, you had to give the jury the option of life without parole. And once jurisdictions have that on their books, it's, they almost never choose um, to execute somebody. And that's highlighted by the fact that this past year, Texas, which leads the United States in the number of executions every year, only sentenced three people to, uh, to be executed. They still have a lot of people on death row and they're still executing somebody like every two weeks, but the pipeline is gonna be drying up for them, just like it is across the country. Um, and uh, here in California, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that we have 743 people on death row right now. We have the largest population of any state in the union. We spend a lot of money, $7.4 billion totally, and $250 million is the average cost. I mean, it's massive in terms of what we spend on death row. And, a, and the amazing thing for those people who advocate for the, the death penalty is that no one is arguing that uh, we should change the rules to streamline it and make it go faster. There are, there are propositions that come every now and then, but they never go anywhere because we believe in the fundamental right of making sure we, we have the right person. And because of the punishment is so final, we make sure that there are all kinds of, of legal uh, steps that can be taken to make sure during the process that the, the process was fair. Despite that, in the history of uh, California, uh, it has been, oh, I forget the number, uh, 13 inmates have been executed since 1978, and we've had, I believe, three people saved off of death row. So, um, so that's the violation of the first prong of St. Thomas Aquinas. Even though we have all those safeguards, those are three people that we know of. The scary part is how many people went to their death who were innocent that we didn't know of. That's the scary part. Um, I was speaking at a, a Catholic university uh, a few years ago and um, and one of the students there got up and he said well um, you know even if they they're innocent of this they're guilty of something that's so they must be there for something and I had to challenge him because I knew of several people who had been res rescued off of death row who were innocent totally innocent one was Kirk Bloodsworth in Maryland here was a former Marine who was found guilty because he was seen in the area. That was it. Somebody had seen him in the area of the girl that had been murdered. And he has the distinction of being the first exoneree off of the death row due to DNA evidence that proved his innocence. And here was a guy who not only uh, served uh, in distinguishment in, in the Marines, but had never gone to jail, had never committed a crime, and was just convicted because somebody saw him in the area. There was another guy, um, this guy out of Arizona, Ray, and I can't think of Ray's last name all of a sudden, but Ray was convicted because he was at the bar uh, where the girl was murdered. The girl was murdered in the bathroom, and he was convicted on the evidence, uh, on forensic evidence that linked the bite marks on the girl to him. It was his bite mark. So, pretty solid evidence there and we've all seen CSI I mean once they have that we know we have the right person well um, like many um, uh, what do they call it criminal investigated services that work for for uh, uh, local municipalities there was a budget issue there was a budget problem at the time and after a few years that budget problem was resolved and the forensic uh, pathologist at that time moved on and a new forensic pathologist came on. This is about like 10 years later. And the new forensic pathologist decided, I'm going to review all of the evidence in all the death penalty cases. And that bite mark for Ray was found in, under the new regime to not match at all. So the evidence that convicted Ray was out the door. He, he wasn't the one who did it, which is what he'd been saying all along and he was released. So 
it's, this is scary stuff. It's scary because it is so final. And right now, we're looking at California. California is our, our, our primary target right now. But we're also trying to, to convince the federal government to get rid of the death penalty. Um, I always uh, try to bring up uh, a, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Bud Welch whenever I speak. Because when, we, uh, when the bishops relaunched the Catholic campaign to end the use of the death penalty in 2005, they asked Bud Welch to be part of that presentation, and I got to know him very well. His daughter was in Oklahoma City, and she was killed in that Oklahoma City bombing. And his story is heart-wrenching and amazing. It's heart-wrenching because when he talks about his daughter, his only daughter, you can feel just how much he loved her. And he talks about when it all happened, how he turned to his Catholic faith to get through it because he had nowhere else to go. And in his Catholic, in his prayers, he kept thinking, I need to do something. And what he did is one of the most unique things I've ever heard. He went to the father of Timothy McVeigh, the man, the, the man who killed, who committed the, the, the bombing. And it turned out that Timothy McVeigh's dad is Catholic. And Timothy McVeigh's dad was in a horrible mess because his, he was feeling the guilt from his son's actions. And when he got to his house and started talking to him, he realized he's a dad too. And so the two of them pray together every now and again. And they are strength for each other to keep going on. And that was what got him to oppose the use of the death penalty. And he's a great spokesman. And one of the times I was with him, I said, it's a shame that you're the only one of the families from all the bombing victims that feels this way. And he looked at me and he goes, oh no, they all feel the same way. And I was like, they do? He said, yes, at first they were all, let's, we gotta get the killer and he needs to be punished. There are certain crimes that just deserve punishment and this is it. So they were all supportive. But after Timothy McVeigh was executed, there was nothing. And slowly but surely, they all started realizing what Bud Welsh had realized. You can't hang on to the anger and the hate. You have to let it go. You have to turn to God for your consolation. And you have to be able to talk to your loved one. I love that when he keeps talking about it. You have to talk to my daughter. So I always try to bring that up because forgiveness is also an important part of our teaching and a very big important part of what our teaching has to do with capital punishment. Um, uh, that's really all I have. Let me see what else I got on here. Yeah, and it, uh, the other thing I was going to bring up, in 2005, the bishop's campaign began. They relaunched the, the campaign to end the use of the death penalty. So if you ever need any sort of uh, information, you can go on to usccb.org and you can go to the Catholic campaign to end the use of the death penalty. And there's all kinds of, of writings from uh, John Paul II, who has called us all to be unconditionally pro-life. I love that phrase, to be unconditionally pro-life. And uh, you can get some of the, the, the information on the catechism, which is based on Thomas Aquinas' uh, teachings. It's all there for us. It's all there at your fingertips. And it's a tough issue. When you talk to people, they can be very hesitant because of fear and anger. Yes? Isn't the death penalty, though, an act of vengeance? It should never be an act of vengeance. If it is, then it's being used wrong. That's one of the things that we found out from our Catholic survey. We would ask people in the survey, we asked them 80 questions. We asked everything, every which way we could, to find out why people uh, supported the use of the death penalty. And even though we teach that you should never use it as vengeance, that was the overwhelming reason people did. Um, uh, the only time you use it is when it's the only way to protect society. But for some people, and it was one of the things that Pope, Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II changed in the catechism, because the catechism uh, wasn't specific enough, so he made it specific to let everyone know that you should only use it when to protect society. That if it's vengeance, then it's immoral. Yeah. There's only two countries in the world that have the death penalty: the United States 
than one other. No, there's several, but we're the only industrialized, we're the only industrialized power that uses it. All the others are Iraq, China, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Somalia, uh, it's, it's countries that you would imagine are just kind of lawless. Um, Russia, Russia uses it a lot. Yeah, um, yeah so um, the, the Catholic teaching, I mean, it makes sense that the European nations are the first ones that have gotten rid of all this stuff, but they didn't get rid of it till the 60s and 70s. Um, and because they're mostly Catholic. We are now uh, in a position to actually start getting rid of its use. I mean, uh, we, we've got a very bright future in that regard. Oh. He's brand new, Jeff Smith, he's a senator from Kentucky, who went to prison because his best friend and partner wore a wire mm -hmm. and got him convicted on a technicality and he served a year and one day in prison. And this book is so unbelievable that if you don't read it, you're missing something. Else. And that brings up another good quality that we as Catholics sometimes never bring up, and that's humility. I mean, we're all sinners. And, um, and remember when Christ uh, was at the well, he didn't say, uh, uh, no, you can't stone this woman. He said, those among you without sin can cast the first stone. So the message there is we should look inwards before we start judging people, especially for something as final as the death penalty. Yeah. Then there are evangelicals, there yeah. There are evangelicals. Why is that? Um, I, or do they even know? I, so I, somebody's explained this to me, and it's, it's called, it's something, it's, it's a theory based on blood vengeance. Mm -hmm. um, that they don't have the teaching uh, of, of, uh, of always allowing for uh, salvation. That there are certain things that are just so heinous that no matter what, even if, you find Christ after you've committed the crime, it still has to be punished. And, and I, I'm not sure if that's accurate, but, but I, somebody has told me that that's actually what they teach. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, people uh, vote for the death penalty, I, I, I've talked to some of my friends and whatnot, is because they said, well, if we're just keeping them alive and we're the taxpayers paying for their, for their stay, just put them out and it'll, you know, ease, ease the funding there or whatnot. And uh, does it cost more money to put somebody on death penalty than a regular uh, uh, person? Yes, way more money. Oh, way more money? Yeah. Wow. Um, because of all the, the legal protections that I was talking about earlier that we have in the Constitution that, they, that folks on death penalty can invoke, one, they have to create a whole section for death row that is, costs more money. And then they have all kinds of legal protections that we pay for that nobody is asking to get rid of. So, all the appeals, everything, the yes. And, and going to court, we all, pay we for pay for that. And they get it, but the regular guys don't. Mm -mm, that are that's right. Okay. Yeah. See, that's the first item, that's for all. That's for the cost, price. yes. That's not just for the debt. No, that's what they pay every year for uh, oh. 7.4 so billion. That shouldn't be on that list, right? No, that's just to give us a breakdown of what the costs are. But it's just the facts and figures of death penalty in California. Right. For everything, it's 114 million. Death penalty, that's for all of them. Right, and, and it's 114 million of that for the death for those on death row annually. Yeah. Right now, they cannot use. Yeah. Yeah, right now, the death penalty can't be used. Courts have stopped it because using the barbiturates that, are, that they use to execute people um, is uh, cruel and inhumane. But they can fix that. Interestingly, though, those same barbiturates or barbiturates just like those are now going to be allowed for assisted suicide. That's okay. But you can't use it for death penalty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
that penalty that's why I'm here. For example, you said like made in law, you know, abuse the child the second time you get they're eligible for death penalty. But not all victims die. They could be really violently, you know. Uh, for example, that Ohio man that kept three women in his basement. Yes. And they were and you know, he killed himself, so we didn't have to worry about, you know, the death penalty with him. But if you say that we can, we only use death penalty to protect society, if, you know, even though the, the victims are not dead, they're still, we still have to protect, you know, our society. We still have to protect society. Violence, yeah. You know, so I, you know, that's how I'm thinking, why would it be just limited to someone that already killed, it's almost an eye for an eye, that's where you get the, the vengeance yeah, idea. The vengeance. Right. Well, right. The, the, what Thomas Aquinas tells us is that if you're going to use the death penalty, it's got to be for the protection of society. Right. So it makes sense if you're going to use it like that, then... Like, for example, yeah. law. I mean, the man that did it the second yeah. time was very violent to the child, but, you know, luckily, it was that you the child survived. Right. And then the other, in other states, there is also... Um, I forget the name of, of what they call it, but you can be executed uh, for not killing anybody if you were part of the commission of the crime. So uh, if, yeah, if you were an accomplice, if you were the driver, and you had all agreed that when they went into the bank they were gonna use toy guns, nobody was gonna get hurt, but one guy did. He used a, a real gun, somebody died. Because what they'll say, what a prosecutor will say is that person who was committing a crime, he knew he was committing a crime, so he knew that the possibility existed that somebody was going to get hurt. So there is a logic there, but from our estimation, it's an extreme logic. So that's what we're trying to get away from. Um, it's most right. a child abuse, you know, crime. Is horrible. Yeah. It's not just horrible, that could potentially kill the child, especially if you're talking about making the law. Yeah. Yeah. Does Megan's law have a provision where that second offense, if they don't get the death penalty, then it is life in prison? You know, that's a good question. I've never looked at that. But um, it's up to the prosecutor's discre uh, discretion as to whether or not they'll invoke that. Uh, and I haven't heard of anybody invoking that yet here, but that's, that's on the books. Right. That's why we say no death penalty in that circumstance. That's why I was asking if there's a provision in there. I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I only ever scan those things to see where the, the, the death penalty provision right. is. Because I see what her, her, see her that, question is. Yeah, yeah. See that, that's why when you go back to the first point here, that's something that we should accept, right? Because we, want, we, we don't want death penalty, but we want to be able to incarcerate people that are violent and protect people. From, so that second point four should not even be you know, added as part of the, to me, it's like I'm looking at that list, like this is how much it's going to cost to, you know, for a death penalty case. But this is really, we need that 7.4 million. For, for our criminal justice system, for our penal system, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you think it's easy, you know, I was on, I was asked to be on a jury for this guy who horribly, horribly molested and killed a three-year-old little girl. And I have a three-year-old daughter at the time. And um, I was put in front of everybody and asked a bunch of questions. And, and I, I finally just said, you know, I can, you know, determine if he's guilty or not guilty, but I, I could never put a guy in, in, you know, on the death, you know, you know, given the death penalty. You think you can, but you can't. And there's a reason for that, because you likely worry for your soul and the soul of all the people involved. Um, it's what we teach. It's, I mean, we, we worry about each other. Yeah. Uh, for those uh, states who no longer have a death, uh, death penalty, mm -hmm. is there a correlation on the uh, crime statistics? Did, did the crime uh, increase or decrease? Um, there are groups like the Death Penalty in Info Org 
group that, uh, that tracks this stuff, but I haven't looked at that lately. I know there was a, a, a study done several years ago that tried to look at and compare which jurisdictions had the highest crime rates because the theory was that some of the states that had the lowest execution rates had the lowest crime rates, that kind of stuff. And, and some of it, was, it, was, it didn't match up fully. There were some places that were uh, uh, actually, some of the big cities were actually kind of safe. Um, so uh, I, I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but I know, I know people do track that and it's, it's online, we can find out. Yeah. One of the issues that we're working on right now is uh, the aftermath of Prop 47. Uh, for those of you who don't know what happened uh, back in 2014, the state legislature passed a bill that, or, or not the state legislature, at the election, an uh, uh, initiative passed that um, required the state uh, to, uh, uh, to let people out of jail who were, had been convicted of crimes that were nonviolent. So if a person had committed a violent crime in their past, they, they, they aren't eligible to come out. But for those people, some for drug addiction and others for, for other things that were nonviolent, they can come out. And the reaction, it went into law in 2015, and the reaction has been, oh my God, our, our crime uh, statistics are going up because of these people. But one of the things I keep telling folks is, no, that's not true. And the reason I know that's not true is because at the beginning of 2015, I was at the uh, Mayor Garcetti's uh, State of the City address, in which he got up and apologized for the spike in crime in Los Angeles while he's been mayor which began long before Prop 47. And across the US, crime has been going up the past three or four years. We don't know why that's happening, but there's a dynamic out there that's separate from rehabilitation. What we know is that when folks uh, are paroled out of prison and just sent home, that their recidivism rate, their, the likelihood that they'll go back to jail within two to three years is something almost like 70% of them. Yeah. But we also know, and we know this through our own Catholic experience of working in, as chaplains and lay ministers in prisons and jails, we know that when we get a hold of these folks who are coming out of prison and we get them involved in their community and we get them involved in programs that are there to help them and we get them involved with their faith, that the recidivism number drops to almost nothing. So that's why we're hopefully, uh, in, in a new phase where, where we actually are helping people stay out of prison. Uh, this question might in part address the, uh, the answer to the previous question, but the 700 and odd, 700 plus in, uh, inmates on death row in California. 743, yeah. Are, are, is, that, are, is that stat proportional to the national average when it comes to um, income status, of the impoverished, or racial makeup? You know, there seems to be a disproportionate amount of it's my understanding that California is uh, representative of the rest of the country, that approximately 48% of all death row inmates all across the country are African American, that the overwhelming majority of those on death row are, are from poor low income families. So, then so uh, the potential for racism or um, poverty may have a great impact on this social issue. Let me go back to the Catholic survey. That was one of the things uh, that we asked about uh, in those 80 questions that we asked. And one of the things we found out was when we brought up the issue of race, nobody cared. It did not move anybody, not even people who were opposed to the death penalty. The one issue that did is the money, but race did not. Yeah. Oh, um, it's a very small percentage. 
I, I use Kirk Bloodsworth as, a, as an example, and Ray Crone, that was his name, Ray Crone out of Arizona. Neither one of them had uh, ever offended before, but what percentage uh, are actually first offenders? I'm not sure, it's gotta be in single digits. The overwhelming majority are, are folks who have been in, in and out of jail, yeah. In California alone. How long, I mean, do you have Well, some, like 30 some odd years, because um, in California, it's, it, it's very difficult to be executed. What the last execution? Ooh, it had to have been about 2004. It was right when Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor. Uh, that was when Monsignor Torgerson out in Santa Monica called me, and he said uh, the governor was a parishioner at uh, St. Monica's and he had agreed to sit down and discuss the death penalty with him before this guy was gonna be executed. So he gave us one last chance to pitch, to, to give uh, the guy clemency or, or commute his sentence to life without prison. And uh, he listened, he was very quiet, didn't ask a single question, and then thanked us, uh, and then executed the guy. Uh, uh, uh. And before you start saying, well, it's because uh, he's a hardcore, Republican guy, tough guy. Uh, remember, Bill Clinton, when he was running for president in uh, 1992, during the election, went back to Arkansas to oversee the execution of somebody who was mentally retarded, to make sure, to make sure everybody understood he was also tough on crime. Being tough on crime is a very good thing for a politician. So, so it's, it's, it's a bipartisan thing here. Yeah. Let me challenge that. I have a great story. Um, in, uh, when I was head of the Catholic Conference for the state of Texas, we, uh, we did our pro-life march, but we put a little uh, twist to it. What we did in Texas was that we invited people to come not only uh, pray in front of the death house in Huntsville, uh, Texas, but we started the day praying in front of the Planned Parenthood facility that was one mile away. So the cardinal and uh, several of the bishops were there and we prayed at the Planned Parenthood facility. And we had over a thousand people with us. So then we walked the mile uh, through, uh, I believe it's, uh, 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 there was a college campus there. It was Stephen F. Austin College or something like that. We walked through that campus and on the other side was the prison where death row was housed. So we're there and we pray the rosary in front of the prison and at one point, when we were almost done, one of the prison guards comes out and says, the warden would like to invite the cardinal and the bishops and the staff to come in and have a tour of the facility. This is a world famous prison where everybody gets executed. I mean, it's on lots of movies and stuff. So the cardinal was like, yeah, let's do it. So we went in and we had the tour, which ended in the warden's office. And when we walked into the warden's office, it was a shrine to Notre Dame. He was a Notre Dame alum. <laughs> and he, he went up to the cardinal and he grabbed the cardinal's hand and he goes, my prayer is that you guys are successful and end this because I walk each one of these guys to their death. I don't want to do it anymore. So I, I think there are folks within the prison system who actually want it to change that do think in terms of rehabilitation and not just punishment. Tell you again, read the book. Yeah, I want to now, no, I want to. Yeah. You were saying that uh, two years ago, uh, we came within 2% of uh, passing an initiative to ban uh, in California. It was four years ago, it was 2012, yeah. And, and, and you said that you were very confident that with all this happened, that it's about to change. Yes. What, what is your gut on this? My gut on this is that um, we were able to get, uh, in Southern California, which is traditionally the conservative part of the state, we were the ones that carried the vote. It was the other parts of the state, Northern California and Central California, that didn't turn out to support this. And they were in shock. There were a lot of people who were like, what the hell's going on down there? And so we started talking about what the teaching was. And I gotta tell you, there are a lot of people in our Catholic network who are just now going, okay, 
Uh, and I think they're about to change. I really do. And I think the support that we have here in the archdiocese with the archbishop leading the way is really convinced that we should end the use of the death penalty now. Yeah, so I'm, re I'm very, very hopeful. Yeah, so, but we are people of faith, so we pray. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much.